I'm Richard Silf from the University of Derby and I work in the Department of Computing and I'm a senior lecturer in analytics and governance and uh, governance of advanced and emerging uh, technologies. I change a title every now and then just so I can keep moving my uh, the students' learning forward. Most of you, I think, were probably there on Sunday when I gave the, my keynote on difference in the other and students achieving uh, great things. That was really the first part, how to get to know your students. This bit is about what happens, how you, once you've got to know them, then what do you do with it and what are the results. Now, one of the things that is really important is that very, across the West at least, universities, sorry, industry, for many, many, many years, has been telling us as academics that our students are technically quite competent, but they are functionally unemployable because they don't have any useful soft skills. This diagram came from some work in 2014 by SAS and the, essentially the BCI, which, uh, BCS, British Computer Society. What are the necessary skills? Separate out into technical skills, the stuff we concentrate on so much of the time, and then the soft skills, the, which are creativity, communication, curiosity, collaboration, storytelling, and problem solving. Now, all the programme that I'm most involved with in, which is the BSc Honours for IT, which is also our analytics, data science course, we take the view that because we're not teaching how a programming language works, where you've got to be really, really careful and you will use all sorts of ways of explaining how the where clause and the when clause and the go to and so on, and you're using a language to illustrate programming principles and the way program programming languages work, it's important to teach step by step, week by week, the technical stuff. And I think the thing that's saying may be true in some other, uh, some other disciplines. However, what we do, where they need technical skills, is here's the learning material, here is the SAS 20 chapters for SAS basics, go and use the stuff and learn SAS. And while they're at that, they're doing uh, some various team activities and they're doing presentations. And across almost everything we do in our BSLT, we spend most of our time on the soft skills. Like Christian, I do not have textbooks on my models because they're not relevant. They're, 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 the textbooks have a little bit here and you need another textbook and another textbook and another textbook and another textbook. And it's a pointless exercise. Anyway, if anything's written down, it's probably on the internet. And they can go find it. Why should I waste my time telling them stuff that they can go find? We know that many of our um, third-year students who go out on placement internships, they go and they suddenly discover that that company wants them to do this project using this language or this something or other, and they haven't got the funding because they're from SME. There's no funding for training courses. Go find a YouTube or wherever. And so they're learning. We're teaching them. How to learn to learn. And so we're trying to put creativity and curiosity back into kids. The curiosity they had as a two-year-old that the educational system destroys by the time they're 17. Our students have no curiosity whatsoever. They're not interested in looking at stuff outside. They have no curiosity whatsoever. We have to put that back into them somehow. Now, the topic here is leadership. I've been doing some leadership work, development work with a, a conference organisation I work, uh, work with. And so I'm going to look at a little bit about academic leadership in a way that's not normally thought about. And I'll look briefly at pedagogy, see what happens. Now, remember, education isn't all about tipping things into these rather leaky buckets that are at our heads. It's lighting pathways or fires of enthusiasm. And I love these two from Albert Einstein. 
imagination is more important than knowledge, and knowledge is limited, but uh, imagination is infinite. Now, this is really a rather interesting one. I have no special talent. This is a guy who invented, proved special relativity. I'm only passionately curious. I just try to get that into the students so they think about why are things happening, what's going on. All of those amazing things that can lead to special relativity. Now, how often when you're in front of your students or with your students do you feel you're in a shambolic situation of trying to herd cats? It just doesn't really work. But the administrative system with the procedures for attendance and so on, it's all, you know, do all this stuff. Get it done. And the students are going to go off there or there or there, going out through the back door to pump or whatever. <coughs> Leadership characters are rather more interesting. Middle East and sheep. It's also a biblical element as well. Sheep know my voice and follow me. But we saw the same in, this, in the First World War. The captain leading his troops up and over and into the fire. He had made that decision that we talked about in the session before, um, in there. He made that incredible, hard, significant decision. All his troops were behind him. And the question really is, how do you look at your students? Are you trying to hurt them and get them in the right place? Or are they actually going to be following you where you want them to go? You see, if you look at leadership, there are things that people talk about, things like vision, passion, walking the talk, and communication and courage. How can we use that? Can we use those factors in the way that we look at leading our students forward? You see, the reason I'm here, the reason I'm doing quite a lot of work in different European capitals every year, talking to business people about advanced uh, emerging technology and so on, is because about five years ago, I got an email from someone through the internet, through LinkedIn, and asked if I could do something. And my boss, he was really rather funny in that. He was the guy who was trying to change a whole ethos within the college that he had just been appointed to from a micromanagement environment where nobody dared talk about doing anything until they'd gone to the assistant dean or the dean and say, can I do this please, my, uh, my or sir? And he said, just go try. Other times, you know, when we're trying to develop stuff, don't come and ask me, Richard, you're not asking me for permission, are you? No. I'm just letting you know what I think I ought to be doing, because there's the evidence, and go try, you'll learn something, you might learn, if you succeed, you might learn, you will learn, if you fail, just go try it out. Now, what was interesting, another, the manager next below him, changed me from academic as domain expert, I know everything about the domain, to that one. Sage on the side, not sage on the stage. And that fa has some fascinating uh, consequences as well. You see, we know that that process there is kind of a bit broken. And yet we know, and Paul was saying that, if you can get close to them, things happen. It works better. They're working in groups, they're working together. And then the tutor or the um, assistant is there. The programming, unless you've got an assistant on your shoulder when this coding breaks or the compiler fails, you will, you will not be able to progress. Having the answer two days later is just too far in the past. You have to have that advice. So, 
There we have Sage on the stage, spouting like when I was at university, three, four hundred in the uh, lecture theatre, and writing on the acetate. Long time ago when I was at university. Or you have the mentor. How many of our colleagues have 50 slides for the hour with 10 to 12 lines of writing on it? And they stand reading it because they can't see it on there, they can see it only there. It's very boring and monotonous. Some of my best presentations or seminar sessions have 5 to 10 slides for the hour. In fact, that includes a couple of slides preparing them the work for the seminar or the workshop that follows. You see, that person in an empty lecture theatre was trying to pour huge amounts of fantastic knowledge. It's really fascinating to him into the, oh dear, the non-existent, into the heads of the students. We know the only person who could learn me. I can learn, but I can't tell you anything. I can't make you learn. One of the things I've been doing for a few years now is the first semester I see the first students, first uh, week, one of the first questions I pose to the 140 or 50, 60 students out there in front of me is, do you want me to teach you questions or answers? Five years ago, five, six, seven years ago, all the hands would go up, oh, you're here to teach us the answers, aren't you? Last year when I did it, about, a, I don't know, five, 10, 15 percent had the right answer. You're here to teach us the questions. I never teach answers. If I teach you answers, you will stop learning. Well, you get it. I love that. I mean, I chose that one because it's just so absolutely <laughs> gorgeous. And look, it's a wrong answer. But it's creative. Like the one we heard earlier on today from, I think it was Russell, wasn't it, about it? That, no, sorry, from uh, Huan, Yuan, uh, who had to leave, about that little boy who thought it through and came up with the wrong answer but the right answer. The question that's I think, to some extent, Christian was talking about this as well. So many of our courses have the textbook. I mean, that one, I think, I'm not sure whether that's the one where that they're able to work with one of the publishers and, and get 12 chapters from any book that they publish, and that then becomes your course book. Gee whiz. But the answer is, the students who have that know that the answers are all in there. Don't we want them to research, collaborate? Because one of the things about many of us here, well in fact all of us probably, we all work in these sort of computer science, e maths type of environment. The interesting thing about our IT environment is the questions have not changed, to my knowledge, in 50 or so years. The fundamental questions about the use of information systems and technology have not changed in 50 years. The answers have changed every year almost, as we go through the cycle from mainframe to mid, midi frame to, what was the next one, networks, and we've been around the cycle a few times now, we've gone back to things that are not called mainframe but are called super servers and cloud. But the fundamental questions that keep the CIOs awake at night, they are the same that I've seen ever since I started in industry in 1973, after university. And we need to get our students working together with learning how to research, to find the evidence that's relevant today. In this company, not that company. In this department, not that department. If you don't do that, you will inevitably get wrong answers. We now look at assessment. How and the drivers we have to be more and more open. And this part of what you're talking about, Russell, is about 
the involvement of students partly in their assessment, wasn't it? So I don't go quite the full way. I mean, some of our pedagogists and uh, uh, educationists in the university are saying, well, they ought to be able to choose to answer your assignment with a dance or a dramatic performance or something. I don't quite go that far because it doesn't prepare them for their job that they're going to get. Because it's unlikely that any of the software companies that Paul's graduates go to are going to take very well to a, the report at the end of a project as being a dramatic performance. There are expectations. It will be in this template, in this structure, and so on. But in terms of being able to allow them to choose things, I'll come on to this in a minute. Now, in almost all of our subject areas, and Chris and Second is through quite a lot, and I think you took us through some, and in fact, everybody has. In most areas of what we're doing, there are no absolutely right or wrong answers, except in, there are some in aspects of maths and um, arithmetic, because that's the way it is. But in the field of, sort of computing and so on, and when you get into my area of governance, there are no right or wrong answers, as long as you keep to the right side of the law. But there are good answers, very good answers, and bad answers. And this is something that's important for the sort of stuff that I teach, is if there are no right and wrong answers, but just good, better, and best, or worse, then you've got to start thinking about justification. Why have you chosen that particular solution, or that particular strategy? So we're looking at some interesting stuff here about assessment. So we're looking at assessment as a way of looking inside their head to see how they think, how they understand, and how they do critical analysis and justification and synthesis, all the rooms at higher levels. So here we are at the stage where I'm now no longer a sage on the stage, I'm not the fount of all knowledge, I actually look to my students to find stuff out that I can learn from them. I did a short presentation some years ago, which was our sort of academics research uh, forum, and I did a five-minute presentation of why I don't do research. Because my students do it all for me. I set them a pro I mean, basically, all of, we all at our university have to supervise anything from five to 15 students each year for their independent studies, their final year project. And I just get them to do if they want to work with me, here is the project. This is what you will do. And you will all find different parts of it, and I will then be able to use your work uh, with attribution at the various business and other academic conferences they go to. So they do my research for me by and large. Guided self-learning here, my major focus is, is on that. Working with them in all of the workshops and where I can do it in the so-called lecture sessions or seminar sessions where I can work with them on average three to five minutes a week. A week. And we're, where we're doing the technical analytics stuff, we use storytelling. They give presentations and so on. So we really work. And here are some examples. Uh, of how the sort of projects we've done at vi various areas of the curriculum. <coughs> what are the results? Lots of tends to be interesting. Almost 100% pass rate. Grade averages up into the 75s, which in England is very high. May not be very high in the US, but in the UK, yeah, 75 is fairly good. Quite high levels of 60% and above, which are the two one and firsts. This one is the most interesting one. Because what I'm doing is working individually with each student each week. Most universities in the, in the UK have a black minority ethnic international student deficit of somewhere around 10 to 15, 20%. difference. 
And the result of that, I was actually nominated about three years ago by the university for the Higher Education Authority's National Teaching Fellowship scheme. Um, I didn't pass that one that time, but uh, it was so significant, and it stayed, it has stayed like that. Now, there's one other compounding factor is that I don't take the submission at week 12. At week 12 or 11, they will come to me with their final formative, uh, final draft for a formative review, for a 10, 15 minute review, against the rubric, a face-to-face -face discussion, and then they have until four weeks, over Christmas at least, until the first week of exams, to submit their final version. They come back to me and see me again, and that's worth 20% on their grades. It duplicates what's going on in the real world. If any of you who've worked in business, you and as a manager, you don't take your graduate, new graduate, and say, here's your 12-week project, and I'll see you in 12 weeks. You know they would fail. You will see them every week for a bit of mentoring and guidance. And that's worth a big difference. It also has something interesting called, that you might be interested in, the correlation coefficient between attendance and grade is R squared equals 0.0378 because they are not engaging with the process, the formal process of attendance. They are engaging with the problem that they sort of set themselves. If I give them a big pro problem like that and they choose little tiny parts. So, are you going to be the academic as domain expert, or are you a coach, mentor, and inspiring your students?